About 50 miles from here, according to Major Corey, there's an Italian fort. It's supposed to guard a track between Derna and Makili, Ted explained. I propose to go in and capture it. If there's a doctor there, we take him and his bag of kit and bring him here. And if there isn't a doctor, Curly asked, frowning. Ted grinned, lit another cigarette, and said simply, Well then, we'll send for one. This fort is bound to be in radio contact with somebody on the coast. Anyway, we're all tired, so we'll sleep tonight and move off tomorrow. Any questions? I suppose we charge this fort with flags flying and drums beating, Sarge, China said, grinning. Or is there some other plan? Ted had to grin at the idea of four men charging a fort. We're going to charge it under a white flag, he explained. I don't know whether any fort has ever been taken by bluff, but we're going to have a go at it. Now you can get your heads down. I don't see any point in anybody losing sleep by doing sentry. Nobody's going to creep into this wadi tonight. Next morning, refreshed and feeling more optimistic as a result of their sleep, they cooked another meal of German beef, and Ted explained their scheme to Major Corey. The wounded man shook his head. I forbid you to try it, Sergeant. I refuse to allow you to risk the lives of yourself and three men for my sake. You have a lorry, you have supplies and some petrol. Try and get back to base. You've been wonderful, but don't stretch your luck too far. And don't disobey my orders, Horace, or it will be worse for you. I am still your commanding officer. Perhaps you would like to come and inspect the men, sir, Ted said gently. What? What are you talking about, Major Corey croaked? You know very well I can't move. Are you sure you can't move, sir? Ted asked. No, don't try. I'll take your word for it. I can't move, was the grim reply. If I could, I wouldn't be lying here. In that case, sir, and Ted smacked his bare heels together and gave the Major a salute, I feel it is my duty to take over command of the unit, until such time as you are yourself again. I hope you will approve. What are you getting at, Horace? The Major asked suspiciously. There's something behind all this chit-chat. Nothing behind it, sir, except that if you feel unable to command the unit, then I must take over. And if I take over the unit, then I am afraid you can't order me about. In other words, sir, and now Ted was smiling, I shall take my three men and go out looking for a doctor. For a moment there was silence. Then Major Corey lifted his hand, slowly, weakly to his forehead in a salute. You are a very determined man, Sergeant Horace, he said. A determined man and a brave man. You know what the old gladiators used to say when they stood in the arena before Caesar? No, sir, I don't. It wasn't in circulation in those days, days Ted chuckled. The Major, in pain though he was, smiled. He used to shout out, Hail Emperor, we who are about to die salute thee. Well, Horace, I salute you. There's not much hope for me, but if you attack that fort, it'll be the finish for the four of you. Don't you believe that, sir? I don't like to contradict you, but my grandmother used to say, and she had second sight, you know. She told me once, you'll have four sons and one daughter, Edward, and one of them will become a great man. And she was serious about it too. I don't see what that has to do with you acting like an idiot and attacking an Italian fort, the Major said, frowning. Well, sir, if my old granny could see into the future, I'm not going to die in the desert. And now Ted's eyes were twinkling. You see, I'm not even married. I haven't got one son yet. So I'm bound to get through the war alive and kicking. Yes, the Major admitted quietly. You know, Horace, it's men like you who do manage the impossible. I can't stop you from going. I can just wish you luck. Just before noon, when the terrific heat put a haze over the desert and made spotting from the air difficult, the fighting four drove out in their captured lorry. They had cleaned their captured weapons and tried out the smizers. They proved to be more accurate than the Thailand Tommy gun Curly had tried, and there was an adequate supply of ammunition. Ted drove north for 30 miles until he reached a maze of tracks running southwest and northeast. He decided that this was the route between Derna on the coast and Makili inland. Somewhere between the two places was the ford. Ted swung the lorry southeast and now Curly and China nursed their smizers and had the safety catches off. Sam Foster sat with Ted and studied the map. It was a square of silk similar to the one Curly had used and showed the North African coastline and a few places oasis, waterholes, wadis and the spots where the long range desert group patrols had left dumps of food, ammunition, water and petrol. The nearest such dump was just over 150 miles away. If they succeeded in getting a doctor to Major Corey, and if as a result the Major was fit to move, then they hoped they could get back to base without too much difficulty. A 
about three o'clock in the afternoon, they dropped down an escarpment, and the fort was there in full view. It was a white building and looked like something out of a storybook. The fort itself stood within a compound. There were watchtowers at each corner of the square building, and there were points in the wall where soldiers could take cover when shooting at an approaching enemy. Good thing we decided not to charge it, Sam said, frowning. I can see a soldier on the roof of the main watchtower, and it looks as if they don't take a good view of us. I didn't expect they would. Ted took one hand from the steering wheel as he spoke, and from his shorts pocket produced a square of white rag. You hang that out of the side, Sam, and keep your fingers crossed, in case they don't believe in fag flags of truce. They were all taut nerved as Ted drove the lorry straight towards the main gate of the fort. If one machine gun opened up on them, it could be curtains for Ted and Sam, possibly the other two as well. Sam continued to wave the square of white rag, and nothing broke the silence apart from the roar of the lorry engine. Ted drove straight to the main gate, shut off his engine, then got out. He looked up at an Italian soldier who was squinting down at him through a rifle slit in the wall. Ted gave the man a cheery wave, felt for a cigarette, and when he was smoking, looked up again and called, Fetch the commander. The soldier did not move, but it was obvious the approach of the lorry had been brought to the notice of the commander. For a few moments later there was a clatter of bolts being drawn, and the gates were swung open. Facing the lorry were two machine guns. Hi, Ted waved cheerfully, then started to walk into the compound. Sam followed him, the white rag lying from his left shoulder across his chest. You come to surrender? An officer asked in perfect English. Us? Surrender? Ted's tone suggested he had never heard anything so ridiculous in his life. Not in your life. We've come to give you a chance to surrender and save bloodshed. Are you the commander of the fort? No. The retort was snapped out. What is your business? I thought I'd just told you, Ted said pleasantly. We've come to give you a choice of surrendering at once or taking the consequences. Now let's not waste any more time. Take me to the commanding officer. I may as well tell you that if this fort isn't handed over within 20 minutes, well, and he shrugged. The Italians looked nonplussed. Holding a fort in the desert had seemed a nice safe job while Roma was pushing the British forces back and back. But recently some rather startling things had been happening. The latest being the attack on the airfield followed within a matter of hours with an impudent attack on a rest house on the main coast road. All kinds of rumours were going about, and the fort had been informed by radio to keep a lookout for roving bands of cutthroat raiders. It had made everyone uneasy. They were quite a distance from help, and the attacks on airfields and coastal traffic had made everyone jumpy. The raiders seemed to materialise out of thin air, then disappear just as completely, leaving behind them burning aircraft, petrol tankers, as well as dead and dying soldiers. A shout from a balcony in the main fort building caused all eyes to turn, and a tubby little man who turned out to be the commandant of the fort called an order for the prisoners to be taken up to him. Neither Ted nor Sam understood what was said, for it was in rabbit fire Italian, but they were escorted at once across the sunlit compound into the coolness of the thick walled fort. A minute or so later they were facing the commandant of the fort. The officer who had spoken to the Britishers explained in Italian what these two men had come for. There followed a moment of amazed silence. Then the fat Italian sucked in a deep breath and would off into a furious torrent of abuse. A torrent which Ted cut short by touching the English-speaking officer on the arm and saying crisply, Look brother, we don't want to spend all day here. In case you don't know, we're fighting a war. I don't want to listen to a speech of welcome, no matter how nice and polite it may be. All we want to know is whether you intend to surrender the fort without bloodshed or whether our forces must bomb you into submission. What? Bomb us? The Italian's face paled a little, and he turned to break into the Commandant's continuing rush of words. Sir, these two men insist that you give them an answer at once. They say you can surrender without bloodshed, or take the consequences, which means heavy bombing within a matter of minutes. That stopped the rush of words. The little fat Italian gulped once, gulped again, then muttered something to the interpreter. As that officer turned to leave the Commandant's office, Ted, who had just had an idea, caught him by the arm. Listen, he said tartly, if you're thinking of sending out a wireless call for help, forget it. We know your wireless wavelength, and if you think our people are not listening in, you are sadly mistaken. Call for help and you won't get a chance to surrender. Insolent dog. Okay, okay, Ted smiled as if he was in the happy position of being master of the situation, with not a thing to fear. You go ahead and call for help. 
but don't say that I didn't warn you what would happen. The officer half turned to the door, hesitated, then turned to translate Ted's words into Italian. The fat little commandant listened, with tiny beads of sweat gathering on his brow and his upper lip. He seemed to be swelling up like a moonstruck bullfrog, and when the interpreter finished, he was almost blasted from the room with a screaming tirade. Looks as if he's calling our bluff, Ted muttered, dropping his cigarette end to the floor and rubbing out the glowing end with his foot. Well, Sam, it was a good try. If I... Sam did not hear any more, for the excited commandant had so suddenly begun screaming again, and within seconds the interpreter was hurrying back into the room. There followed a swift exchange of words, then the officer who spoke English turned to say angrily, We are going to lock you both in a cell, and bring in the men you have left in the lorry. We are not to be frightened into surrendering, and you will please to remember this. If the fort is bombed, you will die along with the rest of us. Oh yes, of course. Ted's coolness left Sam Foster completely amazed. Sam's heart was thumping wildly. He had been in some tightish corners since coming under the influence of Ted Harris, but never before had he been in an enemy fort, trying to bluff a whole garrison to surrender to four men, three privates and a sergeant. There's just one thing Ted pointed out to the English-speaking officer as he called to a sentry standing outside the office door. You might tell your com commandant that we did come here under a flag of truce. Remember? We come in under the protection of a white flag. If you are going to ignore the rules of modern warfare, you mustn't expect any mercy when our chaps come in. Don't forget, they all know we, we came here to offer you surrender terms. Now after you, lead on to the cells. What does he say? The Commandant screamed. The apparent complete lack of fear and the calm composure of the two Britishers was undermining the Italian's confidence. The two Britishers seemed so sure of themselves that he was losing trust in his own position. He had ordered the men to be put in cells, and they had taken it without turning a hair. The interpreter moistened his lips. He too had now lost all his initial bombast. If there had been the sudden thunder of aircraft engines and the thud 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 of falling bombs, he would not have been in the least surprised. To his sweating CO he said, The sergeant says that if we choose to forget the rules of war, he reminds us that they come in under a white flag. Then we must not expect his friends to remember any rules either when they take over the fort. The Commandant suddenly panicked. The stories of raiders who blew whole squadrons of aircraft to pieces, shot up barracks and mess rooms, then vanished as if they had never existed, came back to him in a flood. I must have time to think, he suddenly whimpered. Take them out, give them some food, I must think. And the message to Derna, sir, the officer reminded him. I had better not order that to be sent. This man reminded me that his unit, battalion, whatever it is, would be listening in. If we do call for help, may they not attack immediately? They would be fools to wait until... Get out! You're the biggest fool of all, the Commandant shrieked. Do you want to die? Send a wireless message for help and the bombs will be falling before we've even got an answer to say our people are coming. Get out while I think. The second in command was turning to usher Ted and Sam out, but Ted stopped them with a curt. We have no time to waste. If we do not get a message to your officers within the, within the next ten minutes... They will take it that you are refusing to surrender and are keeping us prisoner. Tell your officer we must have a yes or no at once. It was Sergeant Harris's cleverest move. It prevented the Italian commandant gathering his scattered wits and perhaps deciding to try to hold the fort. There was another exchange of words. Then the second in command said, What are your surrender terms? Have you authority to speak? I have. Ted felt like yelling his joy aloud but when he spoke his voice was its usual crisp self. All your men will pile their arms in the forecourt. They will then go to their quarters and remain there. The keys will be handed over to me. You will accompany me to the radio room. And afterwards, what happens to you, whether you will be sent back to Alexandria by air or by motor lorry is not for me to say, Ted told them. One thing, you will be giving honourable treatment as prisoners of war. If you agree to these terms, then you will accompany me outside while the orders are carried out. Sam Foster could hardly believe the evidence of his ears. He had agreed to come with Sergeant Horace, China and Curley, simply because he had been with them since joining the army. Not for one moment had he believed that Horace's wild scheme might come off. Yet here they were, walking down the stone steps to the courtyard, while the sentry who had escorted them and the English-speaking Italian officer was already off to call the bugler to sound the assembly. In the next half hour, an astounding little page in the history of warfare was written. Some 80 officers, NCOs and men 
were assembled to pile their arms and then returned to their quarters to await marching orders. Ted allowed the Italian flag to remain flying, and after calling for men who could speak English, chose one frightened little man out of the volunteers. He took this man up to the wireless room. After first calling into the fort China Brown and Curly Bates, China was left to make sure the officers, with the exception of the commandant, kept to their mess room. Curly stood guard over the other ranks. In the wireless room, Ted spoke to the private soldier who spoke English. You want to go back to Italy in one piece? Oh yes, yes, I'm a poor soldier, a conscript. Well, listen carefully, we need a doctor. You will instruct the wireless man that he is to call Derna. No, we'll see if we can get a doctor from Makili. There'll be less chance of interference from there. Call Makili and say that we have a man who is very seriously injured with a splinter of steel in his spine. Can they send a doctor at once, as the man cannot be moved until the splinter is removed? Have you got that? The Italian repeated the message. Ted then told him to give it to the wireless operator and tell him to call McKeely and see what they said. There followed a tense silence in the room, broken only by the chatter of the Morse key and the hard breathing of Sam Foster, who was writing down the message. Sam was an expert wirelessman, and though he understood no Italian at all, he could write down the letters. When the wirelessman ceased his barrage of dots and dashes, Sam handed the paper over to Ted, who held it in front of the Italian soldier. Read that, he ordered, and gave a little sigh of relief when the Italian read out the same message that Ted had asked to be sent. It's a good thing for everybody. If there's any trickery at all, there'll be trouble. A minute or so passed before there was more than an acknowledgement from Achille. Then came word that the request had been passed on, but they were looking for the doctor. When the reply eventually came, it was to the effect that the doctor was busy, but would arrive at the fort about sundown. In the meantime, a table must be scrubbed, clean sheets provided, there must be an ample supply of hot water for sterilising instruments, the doctor would bring along bandages and his own local anaesthetics. The next hour and 20 minutes was a busy period for Sam and China Brown. Sam was given orders what he had to collect. The first order was to see that the officers under the eye of China Brown were marched across to the barrack room and put in with the private soldiers, the NCOs and the cooks, etc. There they could be watched over by one man. China took over the guard duties there and lounged in the doorway with a loaded Schmeiser automatic nestling in the crook of his right arm. He called for silence the moment Curly and Sam had gone and said, Listen you blokes who understand English, everybody has to sit down and the first one to get up will collect from me and this. He tapped the Schmeiser significantly. Anybody want to ask a question? Okay then, sit and don't talk. He was grinning as he watched the Italians settle themselves on beds, all watching him, all silent. Outside the barrack block, Curly and Sam worked like ants with a shipping order to deal with. They collected a trestle table, sheets from the officers' sleeping quarters, then two Dixies from the cookhouse. It was while they were in there they got the whiff of baking bread. Opening the oven door, they were in time to take out bread which was just baking to a turn. Cor, Curly murmured. I haven't smelt anything so good since I went crazy and joined the army. Sam were having this little lot, and he broke off a small piece of bread and popped it into his mouth, only to eject it immediately. It was far too hot for even his taste. They filled up the lorry's petrol tank, then carried across extra petrol and jerry cans. They then filled jerry cans with water and stowed them on the opposite side of the lorry. From the fort's kitchen they brought food, tinned food mostly, and were still piling up stores when Sam thought he heard the drone of an aircraft engine. The sound grew more distinct, and then they saw a single-engined Breda fighter obviously coming in to land. Sam and Curly hastily grabbed a rifle each from the pile stacked in the open before the fort, then hurried to the main gates to pose as sentries. The Italian flag was still flying, and with two men on guard at the gates, there seemed no reason at all why the pilot of the plane should have any suspicion that all was not well. Up in the wireless room, Ted Horace watched the plane touch down about a quarter of a mile from the fort. It turned and the pilot began to taxi near the fort, the whirling prop blowing up great clouds of yellow dust. Everything was going according to plan, and it was then that Sergeant Horace made his first mistake. With the butt of his Smith & Wesson, he smashed in the front of the wireless set, the valves popping and flashing. To the Italian, he said, I don't like smashing good stuff, old son. But in war you can't afford to take chances, can you? Then he ran from the room and went scuttling down the stone steps, his heelless sandals flapping. The two Italians he left behind looked at one another for a moment. 
Then the wireless operator reached over the smash set and pushed in a plug. A moment later he was reaching for a hand microphone and beginning to call on a set tuned in to aircraft wavelengths. They will come back, the other Italian protested. You are mad, they will, they will kill us both. The wireless operator brushed the other man aside and went on calling. He called half a dozen times, then gave his message. Take off at once. The fort is in the hands of the British. The fort is in the hands of the British. Take off please, take off and warn McKeeley. Outside the main gate of the fort, the Breda two-seater fighter had slowed to a halt. The pilot applied his brakes but did not cut his ignition, so his engine remained idly ticking over. He opened the fuselage door and gave the doctor a hand down, then dropped the bag containing the surgical instruments and supplies. I will be here soon after dawn, doctor, the pilot called. I hope you have a comfortable... And there he stopped. His wireless set had come to life and an agitated voice was calling him. He turned, adjusting the set a little, while the doctor, bag in hand, looked up interested. Then came the vital message. Take off at once. The fort is in the hands of the British. Take off, please. Take off and warn McKeeley. Thank you.